Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Safest Family on the Block. My name is Jason, and joining me today is Roma McCoy Keller. Hello, Roma. Hello. <laughs> now, this is a real treat, because as I was saying to Roma just before we started recording, I have been wanting the insights of an emergency room nurse since I began this show in 2020. But unfortunately, due to COVID, they've been very, very busy. And so finally, Roma's been able to come onto the show and talk to us about the things that we can do or stop doing so she sees our kids less often. And yes. with that, Roma, could you tell us a little bit about your experience? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, like you said, I'm an emergency room nurse. I have uh, worked um, at two different hospitals now. My nursing career has spanned over the last 10 and a half years in emergency medicine solely. Prior to um, my 10 years of being a nurse, I was also an EMT. So I've seen a little bit of everything from in the field um, to now at bedside in the hospital. Worked at little critical access hospitals as well as where I am now at this trauma two um, hospital, level trauma two. Yeah. So you, you use a couple of terms that I'm not sure everybody's familiar with. Uh, one was a critical. Critical, critical access, yeah. Okay. So I was born and raised um, on a giant cattle ranch in Montana. My parents are ranchers. And coming from that, I was most familiar in kind of smaller communities. Um, and so a critical access hospital mm -hmm. is a hospital that is based in a smaller community with um, fewer beds, less resources. Um, where I worked, we only had a physician and a nurse on, um, and I worked nights at that hospital. So it was when we had nine beds in the emergency department, we had to essentially fly anything critical or life threatening um, out to a larger hospital. Level one trauma hospital would be something in a larger city, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, something with a burn center and with all specialties 24 hours a day. And a level two, which is where I'm at now for a mid-level city, but we don't have a burn center. So that's basically what makes us a level two. Okay. And those, just as an aside for parents who are planning travel with kids or to spend some time living abroad or something, those, <clears throat> those are terms to get to know. Yes. So that you can, when you're looking at destinations, whether you're choosing a destination or you've got a job assignment in a particular place, yeah. finding out what is the nearest hospital, what's its trauma, you know, what's its trauma level. Um, a lot of our viewers know that I spent a year in Malaysia with my kids. And one of the things there was, listen, for anything, anything worse than a broken arm, you're going to Singapore or you're going to Bangkok. Yeah. Because there was nothing in, not even KL that could handle a serious injury. And also the, med the degree of medical training in Malaysia for doctors was not up to the international standard. No, no. But yeah, so, so knowing that kind of thing is, is, is important. So thank you for defining those terms. Yeah. And so in your experience in those smaller hospitals and now in the larger, in the larger cities, Bend of course is a place with a lot of, um, a lot of injuries, a lot of yeah. kids and teenagers. Because there's yes, a lot of yes. really cool outdoor activity. A lot of people climbing mountains who should not be climbing mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. yeah, my favorite term that I tell everyone, mm -hmm. especially folks that live here in Bend, is teach your kids how to do dangerous things safely. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they get into <clears throat> danger, teach them how to be calm and get themselves out. <laughs> yeah. Which is um, unfortunately something that isn't taught a lot. Um, and here in Bend, you know, kids start riding bikes. At, I have a seven-year-old and we, we put her on her first bike at 18 months old. As soon as she could walk, she was on her strider, just, you know, heading down the street. So it comes with a lot of responsibility to be a parent and wanting your kid to do all the, all the finer things in life. <laughs> And it's, it's that balance that we, <clears throat> excuse me, it's that balance that we have to really tread all the time of, we want our kids to grow up into a human being who can accurately assess risk yep. and <clears throat> address risk properly and as safely as possible. But we also don't want to see them cry. No. Uh, and so sometimes, you know, standing back and going, well, I guess they're going to learn why you don't do that in three, two, one can be very, very difficult. They can but, be very difficult. Yeah. 
Yeah, one of one of my parenting, uh, you know, what's the word? And mottos is boo boos are okay. Boo boos mm-hmm. are even necessary. Mm-hmm. Injuries we want to avoid. Absolutely. And and that's where your professional capacity comes in, where you see kids every day coming in for everything from the stupid to the tragic. Yep. And so before you, we came on today, you made a list of the stuff that we can do or stop doing yeah. so that there are fewer injuries and more boo-boos yeah. or maybe a, a re- the same amount of boo-boo. Yeah, so um, mm-hmm. kind of what I did is I broke it down mm-hmm. into age groups because okay. you're not going to be worried about the same thing for a very young toddler as you are with a teenager. Yeah. Well, in some instances. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> So we uh, start start at the bottom and kind of work our way up. Um, Perfect. That newborn to three year old phase is, um, you know, it's it's the precautionary phase. It's the phase where what we see coming into the emergency department is kids um, choking. Number one is the number one thing. They're starting to learn food. They're starting to learn how to chew. Um, and uh, you know, you choking is bound to to happen mm-hmm. um as well as you know just kids that age have oral fixations is what we like to say so they put things in their mouth that shouldn't be going mm-hmm. in their mouth yeah. um i worked yesterday mm-hmm. and i had a mom who was unloading her dishwasher and the dishwasher pod got stuck and didn't completely disintegrate and her 18 month old put it in his mouth Ugh. So, you know, things like that, everyday things mm-hmm. where you think, hey, I've got everything, all my cupboards are locked, my dishwasher pods are put away mm-hmm. safe. It's those <clears throat> those just unexpected moments where you yeah. see these kids grab those and, and put them in put them in their mouth. You know, um, one, uh, one real important example of that that was brought to my attention by a toy safety specialist is mm-hmm. the older siblings toys. Yes. <clears throat> which you wouldn't. You wouldn't let a toddler play with that or a baby right. play with that because they're going to choke on it. Mm-hmm. But the eight-year-old, they're not going to choke on it, but they are going to leave it around. Yeah, they're going to leave those Legos around. They're going to leave yeah. those Barbie shoes or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, what we see a lot is um, things that are quarter size. You mm-hmm. know, anything in, uh, smaller and under is extremely dangerous for that 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 age group, that three and under age group. Um We've had numerous x-rays with quarters or, you know, uh, Hot Wheels wheels stuck in mm-hmm. in kids' throats, essentially, after choking. Um, and it, that that is a, and then that's a flight. That's a, that's an emergent helicopter ride to Portland to see a specialist and get that out. So those are just little things that'll end up costing you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. Plus a day or two of real angst and trouble yes yeah, if we're extreme, lucky extreme anxiety <laughs> yeah on yeah. the parents part yeah yeah okay. and, the other thing we see a lot with this age group is um you know the parent that thinks the kid's okay and they leave them alone whether it's in the bathtub on a changing table um in a playroom without the gate closed to some stairs you know it, little little things that you as parents you're exhausted you're you're trying yeah. your best to do everything right and it's just those little minuscule things that those kids are just you know they're on they're rolling off changing tables they're falling down stairs and um yeah. and making sure your house is secure and safe for your kiddos is number one at that age yeah. When, when my little one was one and a half, uh, he, I'd take him grocery shopping to give his mom a bit of a break. And also that's where he learned to count and learned his colors, yeah. uh, but he loved to stand in the place where you put the baby to sit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I was in line and uh, it was an ER nurse who just was in line behind me telling me, dude, don't do that. I see a couple kids a month who fall from there. So, but he, he likes to stand. She says, well, put him in the, put him in the large place there that's up to his yeah. chest and let him stand in there. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a much better idea. Yeah. That's a much better way to do this. <laughs> yeah, it very much is. Yeah. yeah, it's safer. They usually fall back, so it falls right yeah. in the big basket. Yeah, exactly. So now, and then he just stood there in the big basket. Sometimes he stepped on eggs, but that's okay. He was learning about physics. Yeah, he um, was thrilled. <laughs> yeah, but that 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 falling. So high surfaces in the bath is a big one. Yeah, um, huge, huge one. Yeah. We um. You know, coming into spring and summer, um, 
drownings are, we see, unfortunately, way more than we want to um, in Central Oregon with all of our lakes, the Deschutes yeah. River, and now almost every community in Bend has a pool. Yeah. So we- And not we just definitely... pools, not just kiddie pools, but a uh, five gallon bucket you left out in the rain. Yeah. Um, anything with even a couple of inches of water is a drowning hazard for, for the under threes. Yeah, really it is. Yes. And, um, you know, we've, we've had people to buy those pools for their dogs to cool mm. off on and before they know it, their kids in the pool. And it's just, yeah. unfortunately, absolute vigilance with your children um, yeah. at, at all times, which is exhausting, but uh, mm. very, very much worth it when you're, yeah. you know. Uh, so that so that, those are the big ones for the for the very little ones. Yep. Um, I've also heard about a uh, hot water burns. Is that also a, a big issue with the that age or is it when they get a little bit older and more? So that's in my next group. Okay. The three, kind of the three to five, kind of the pre kindergarten three year olds. Mm. Those are our we call them our curious, our impulsives, and our fast. Yeah. They, they're you suddenly know? that that moment when your child goes the first the first time they crawl. Yeah. It becomes an entirely new ball game because they're not going to be where you left them. Yeah. No, it's a totally different ball game. It's a totally different ball game. They, um, yeah. you know, I, I, I grew up ski racing, um, mm -hmm. in Montana. Um, and you know, a friend had lost his toddler in a pool where he had his back turned and, and nobody kind of made the judge like, Hey, I'm, I'm going over here. You're going over here. And, you know, his, his daughter unfortunately drowned and uh, was a life that was unable to be saved. Um, and you know, I think you touch on an important piece there and it's very similar to if you're administering first aid, the instructions aren't say, Hey, somebody call 911. It's you in the red hat. Yeah. Call 911. Yeah. When we're, when we're monitoring our kids, if you need to go take a, you know, use the restroom or go grab another drink or whatever. Hey, John. Yes, absolutely. Watch the kids. Mm -hmm. you know, hey, Svetlana, yeah. watch the kids. For yeah, that, that yeah. Make sure that somebody is specifically on duty at all times. Yeah, my husband um, and I, my husband's a paramedic and mm. an engineer with Ben Fire. Um, and so we have a rule that, uh, you know, I say, Roma's out, I'm leaving, Dave, you're on, mm. you're, you're on pool duty, you have to watch. And at that point in time, you know, any conversation he's having has to stop and He's on he's on pool duty until I can tap back in. It's a something that's very important to us. Yeah, we like to. Share Mr. Riker, you have the calm, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, the thing yeah. that that um, I see a lot, unfortunately, in the four to five year age mm -hmm. range where they're starting to become tall enough, is they want to help mom or dad cook, and they pull the handles off the stove. Mm. We see that a lot, a lot in the wintertime. People tend to cook inside more in the wintertime, mm. cook heavier pots and pans. So kids want to reach mm. up and grab onto those. And yeah. then you get the, the burn, the scalp yeah. burn. And even if it's not a burn, that's a that's a metal pot full of water that just fell yes. half a foot yes. on your kid's head or foot or arm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've also heard from an EMT that I interviewed very early in the show that uh, uh, coffee and tea. Yeah. We leave that hot beverage that clearly brings mommy and daddy a lot of comfort. And we set it down within reach. And of course, they're going to grab for that and give it a try or try to bring it to you. Yep. Or, you know, just, and it's so easy to very mindlessly put that Starbucks cup or that mug with a, with a fun phrase on it down just yep. absolutely. But instead, putting it at the center of the table or up high on it can make a huge difference. Huge difference, yeah, it does. It it uh, it makes a, a a very large difference. Um, it's 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 amazing how our little little tiny practices in everyday life can really um, ultimately save your child's life, um, yeah. and prevent them from from a life of difficulty, whether or not you know, especially if you're someone who cooks with cast iron, those pots are extremely heavy. Yeah. And those um, those pots to a head on a two year old or a three year old can make a world of difference in their life. Yeah. And that's even if they're not full of boiling water or hot grease. Absolutely. Even if they're just just empty on the on the on the stove. Yeah. 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 Those back burners are our friends, folks, especially, in those <laughs> especially for deep frying or something like that. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we see a lot of kids that age also choking. They are, um, because they're walking and they're moving, they want to put something in their mouth and then follow a friend. Um, they want to, you know, just eat really fast to get back to whatever they were doing outside. Hot dogs around the 4th of July or, mm. oh man, we, we unfortunately see that a lot. Yeah. Um, I think that, oh, yeah. that we run into at that age with some of those tasks, we run into this, these, this double danger zone where the kids are finally good enough at eating that they're not concentrating on it the way that a, two, a two-year-old concentrates on it. Mm-hmm. And the parents, we're starting to feel like we might be out of the woods. Yep. And so our vigilance goes down a little bit. I mean, I, I think every parent I've ever talked to when it's an infant, like once or twice a day, they'll just kind of go over to the sleeping one and make sure they're still breathing, even mm-hmm. though there was nothing that happened. Nothing. There's no reason to think yeah. something's gone wrong. We just got to yeah. wander on over there and check. Um, and around four or five, we, we've, we've stopped doing that. We, we're, mm-hmm. we're pretty sure they're fairly durable and they are more durable. Yeah. But we're starting to be a little less attentive and they're starting to be a little less attentive. And those two can combine to choking on a hot dog on, on the 4th of July. Mm-hmm. 4th of July really is the most dangerous day of the year for mm-hmm. many, many reasons. It is by far our busiest day of the year um, in the emergency department and our most deadly for um, males and mm-hmm. for children. Well, we don't have any other holidays where you are encouraged to drink and play with explosives. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's a it's a double negative, and so that is one double negative that does not equal a positive. Yeah. And although we don't usually let the four and five year olds drink, we do encourage them to play with explosives. We do. Um, yeah. Sparklers are mm. insanely. Um, they're 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 terrifying for an ER nurse, mm. especially for a child eyes. Yeah. 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 I've um every EMT or ER our doctor and nurse I've ever spoken to has very strong opinions about sparklers in particular, because Mm -hmm. I don't think we civilian parents know those things burn at thousands of degrees. (laughs) And, uh, and we encourage kids to run around with and a fence with them. Uh, And, and play with them and run and trip and they are sharp. And we have a lot of really soft things in our face that sparklers can yeah. yeah yeah the 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 very common injury that i heard of from from a couple of emt friends is they they fall down onto the sparkler mm-hmm. and then it's pinned there on their chest at several thousand degrees yes for in sometimes a minute yeah and just, yeah. just uh, i'll let your imagination run with that yeah. folks but it's yeah i have i have seen that unfortunately mm-hmm. i've seen that and i've seen um a, a parent who sets up a firework and it goes, they think they're setting up the, right direct, the correct direction. It goes mm. into the crowd. Mm. And, and so, yeah, I think I was not um, one of the people that was upset when Oregon banned fireworks in city limits. So. Yeah, mo- most of the professionals I know are not. Um, no. for those reasons. I mean, fireworks are fun. Fireworks are cool. And yes. Bend in particular, my family's from central Oregon. So, yes. you know, the, when they had the big fireworks show up there on Pilot's Butte and they always mm-hmm. set the hill on fire every always, year, every year, every yeah. year. Part of the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we go there to, to that, to the park and watch it there every year, but that's the professionals over there. Yeah. Um, so, although we've, we've, we've kind of digress because that danger is for every age, including us adults. In fact, sometimes uh, adults give our, we give ourselves permission to be dumb in ways that we would not allow our kids to. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for that, for that pre-kindergarten, kindergarten age, those burns mm-hmm. we we're talking about, whether it's fireworks, whether it's boiling water, and again, choking are all things yeah. that you see far too often. Yeah, we do, unfortunately. Um, what we... What I have started to recommend for Mm -hmm. families is um, basic life-saving CPR Mm -hmm. first aid courses. Um, I know Mm -hmm. our fire department here in town offers a course the first Wednesday of every month Mm -hmm. that's free to the community that goes over CPR and the Heimlich maneuver and basic first aid, um, tourniquet placement, you know, stop the bleed, anything Mm -hmm. that could immediately save you or your child's life um and um to just viewers that stop the bleed that you use that's a branded term for a uh it's kind of the next thing after your basic red cross first aid 
that's about stopping arterial bleeding and serious bleeding, tourniquet of pressure, trauma pads, um, proper application of direct pressure. You can take that course free online mm -hmm. and it'll take you half an hour. And yep. it's, um, it's, it's absolutely recommend. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. I absolutely recommend it. Um, I teach it. I um, carry Stop the Bleed kit in my vehicle. I made every single member of my family take a Stop the Bleed course. Yeah. So really, I can't speak too highly of it. Yeah, um, and it's one of those, again, it's one of those that you can do this weekend for free. Yep. And make your kids, your spouse, your friends, your family, your neighbors that much safer immediately yeah yeah i mean uh we this is digressing but had a gentleman who came across the motorcycle crash yesterday and um had he not taken stop the bleed and had a kit in his car the man who crashed on his motorcycle would have lost his life and because yeah. this man was prepared and took this course um you know a 43 year old father of two is alive yeah so and as parents, you know, that being involved in the community, helping the community is fantastic, but also you can apply this immediately to your child if you are in a car accident or, yep. yeah, or they have a terrible bike accident or any of the, if we avoid, if we don't avoid that injury, what we do between the time we find out about it and when the ambulance arrives, that that can't save our kid's life. That's the purpose of first aid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So yeah, then um, that, those are the big ones for that age group. Another one is just helmets. Yeah. A lot of parents don't put helmets on their kids when they're riding those Razor scooters or any scooter for the matter. Yeah. And they think, oh, they only need it on a bike. They And they really, really need them on those scooters yeah. and in those electric vehicles that, that kids can drive. Mm -hmm. um, they do go off curbs, they do fall. and that age their head is still the largest part of their body and it goes down first so helmets save helmets, lives. Yeah, helmets I, I think uh, a lot of parents are especially the parents who are going to be watching this channel are 100 percent briefed on bike helmets yeah but you know like you say the razor scooters the inline skates the regular skates the yeah. the electric skate scooters board. skate all of those things mm -hmm. also you know having the, the helmet and the, the elbow pads are a little tougher sell and not as um, vital, but if you've ever seen what happens when that doesn't work, yeah, it's it's a good. They're all if you can talk your kids into it, it's it's good. It is good. You're absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. do you have any advice on buy, getting buy-in from the kids? Because you know, not every kid thinks that it's cool to wear a helmet. Not every kid wants to run back into the house and get their helmet. Not every kid remembers when they're running out excited to go jump on the skateboard and go to the park with their friends. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any advice on getting that buy-in? Boy, um, you know, for us, it was it, it was not an option in our yeah. house and it's, it's still not an option. Um, my husband and I find it very important that we also wear helmets. I see a lot of families riding around Central Oregon with the kids in helmets and the parents not wearing one. Mm. And, and your kids are watching everything you do. Yep. And if you make it not a choice and everybody in the family wears it, it's a lot easier to enforce, I believe. So make it the same kind of routine with the seatbelts. Just yep. that this is this is the thing that we do. Yep. Um, you know, the kids kids don't listen, but they're watching every yeah. second. Every single day. Yes, they are. Yeah. Yeah. It's our next age group, the six to twelve um, age group that are our our independent are um you know just they want to be so just fiercely independent and they're so distracted they're distracted mm -hmm. by everything whether it's um you know friends when they're talking if they have a, a electronic device um anything even if they're listening to music they're distracted and they're at a much larger risk than than the next age group these six to twelve year olds are so they're, wanting, they're wanting that independence, but they, by the time you get to 12 or 13, you've got a little bit of sense. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah. The six to 12 year old age group is where we see our largest lacerations. It's our largest group of kids that come in with hand and facial lacerations. Um, it's our largest group of, in general, for concussions. You know, these kids aren't 
when you get older, you see your high school sports, your high school athletes getting concussions. But this group, it's just, they're just falling. You know, they're falling off bikes, they're falling off curbs, they're running into things. And, and um, then they're beginning sports, which is dangerous because oftentimes you have a few kids that are very good at things and the kids who are just learning. And they're, that's, that's a, a mix, mix for a concussion, for sure. You get all the risk and none of the skill. There yep. we go. And then that's also when the uh, one thing that happened to both of my kids is that's the age group where they start to get that aggressive growth, yep. which means their head is like two inches higher than they remember their head being. Absolutely. And that's when that kitchen counter concussion yep. happens or the low the hanging island. branch in the backyard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They um this is also our highest number of trampoline injuries. Again, mm. people who you know, I can't, I cannot stress enough having that net around a trampoline. I grew up in Montana with no net and um, older siblings that you know, double jumped me off the trampoline. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I have to admit, I, I did have, you know, bilateral broken arms and a broken mm -hmm. leg as a kid. A lot of my injuries were, were uh, sibling related, if you will say. Yeah. Orthopedic surgeons and physical therapists love those trampolines. They do. They do. And ER nurses and physicians absolutely hate them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, you just, yeah. you know, you have that mix. You have them, you know, you get these eight year old kids. They're in third grade. You have some mm -hmm. that are still quite petite, but some that are, you know, 100 plus pounds. And, and mixing those two together is, um, yeah, it's tough. You know, you get those big kids on the pitcher's mound and then you get kids in with uh, orbital fractures because they're not wearing the proper eye protection, you know, playing baseball or helmets. Mm -hmm. um, they start to play tackle football, all those things, soccer injuries, um, you know, the, the trying to do a header or just running into one another is amazing. Yeah. What we see. Sounds like, um, you know, if you sign up your kid for some kind of sport after, after school sports, little league, uh, going to the local club, whatever. It sounds like taking the time to really vet the coaching, yep. watch a few practices, make sure that people are being vigilant, make sure yeah. that, I mean, you know, you and I are probably about the same age. So we grew up in an era where coaching that there was a very fine line between what happened in wrestling practice and straight up physical abuse of, ch of children. Yep. Um, and I think that some of that actually made me into the successful person I am today, but a lot of that was way overboard. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. there's still a lot of coaches now that I think feel that that drill instructor coach vibe is appropriate. Yep. And yep. it's, it does lead to injuries guys. Mm -hmm. It does. It absolutely yeah. does. And I know that um, oftentimes um, what we're seeing now is parents mm -hmm. who aren't letting their kids after the concussion, get the proper brain rest that we recommend mm -hmm. and they're sticking them back on the field. And they're getting another concussion. And, yeah. you know, for these little brains, that's really need to follow the recommendations of your child's yeah. doctors, nurses, and, mm -hmm. and make sure that their brains are healed and healthy. Yeah. They're... And to be really honest about what goes on in Little, little League and, um, you know, the, the coaching, the coaching uh, environment for kids that age, on the one hand, you've got a doctor telling you what they know based on peer-reviewed research and their own experience. On the other hand, you've got the coach mm -hmm. who, let's be clear, he is the person who said one, two, three, not it last when they were <laughs> asking for people to volunteer to coach Absolutely. that team. Mm -hmm. So one of those people is much more qualified to make that decision than the coach and honestly than us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I, I tend to, I've coached every sport my daughters wanted mm -hmm. to play in so far which makes yeah. her a very busy mom, but also mm -hmm. I know that she's everything being followed appropriately. Yeah. And that's uh, just as an aside, that is in, you know, I've been doing this show for about for three years now and I've been a parent for much longer than that. Um, the thing we can do, the most important thing I think we can do to keep our kids safe. And it's also the least exciting yeah. is to volunteer at the schools, volunteer with the sports teams. Yes. Um, so that you're there to see things so that the other staff knows you so that they know that, oh, that kid's parent is active and involved and ferocious. Yep. So we're going to listen to that kid more. Um, it, and it even it goes out into things like even school shootings so that you know the grounds of the school, you know, the yep. security policies of the school. Absolutely. You, and then your kid also knows that you care enough to give this time. 
yeah. which feeds into the feeds into your communication with them, feeds into their self-image. It is the most important thing we can do to keep our families safe, even though it is a hassle and sometimes it's it's boring. Yeah, but yeah. it's it's very worth it. I I, I totally yeah. agree. I yeah, it's it's the most important thing we can do for our children to show up and, and be present. Yeah. And so for this for this age group, this late elementary age group, we've got uh, uh, sounds like uh, horsing around um, yeah. is one of the big things, and we want them to horse around. Yes. <laughs> but you know, some what are some of the ways that we can encourage them to horse around safely, or you know, and, and stick to the boo boos and not the injuries? Yeah. Yeah. So um, you know, we we encourage open communication, mm -hmm. um, all safety measures. Uh, and that's why the, the earlier age group teaching kids how to do dangerous things safely. Um, if you, encouraging your children to use their words, encouraging them to tell their friends to stop if they're doing something that hurts them, um, and encouraging them to have enough confidence to walk away um, yeah. when something is going the wrong way. Yeah. And I, I'll put in a stick. Um, I don't know if yeah. Roman and I know each other through Erica, who was on the show earlier. I don't know if she mentioned my background, but it's it's very martial arts centric. Mm -hmm. But at that at that three to seven range, getting them in an Aikido class, a Judo class, a gymnastics class, or a parkour class, any any skill, martial art, or athletics that has as an integral part of the training how to fall down without getting hurt badly. Yes. Because that that late elementary school, they're going to spend half their time falling down. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Um, and there's a number of, of, like you said, different ways to do that, whether it's through gymnastics or martial arts. Um, and, you know, we don't see, honestly, a lot of injuries from those kids that we don't have kids coming in from gymnastics or the martial arts studios to the ER because they're taught at an early age or they're taught, even if you're taking them in later, they're taught the basics first. Yeah, which is really we value that as well. Yeah. So the, any, any of those skills training earlier than late elementary can help our late elementary kids as they become more independent, mm -hmm. as they start taking more risks, as they start spending more time with kids who are maybe bigger, maybe dumber. Yep. Um, and <laughs> they, can help them. They will spend time with kids that are bigger and dumber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I think, you know, our parent led communication is so important in this age group. Um, we see, so many kids who have not as good relationships with their parents more frequently in the emergency room than those kids who have better relationships with their parents, whether it's just confidence building, um, knowing that they have a safe place to go to. It's usually those parents are more involved. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're taking more precautionary measures. Um, so their kids don't end up in the emergency department. They're going to their yearly checkups with their physicians mm -hmm. and physicals with their doctors. And it just, it, it's all, it all starts very early. And I don't think that that's taught as much as it should be. We should, we need more parenting classes. <laughs> and, and I appreciate you coming on to educate the parents on what, you know, you have a unique and important perspective to childhood injury and childhood safety. safety. Mm -hmm. And so again, it sounds like that those rough and tumble years between like second and sixth grade, it's all about, they're not going to make smart decisions. So give them no. the skills to give them the skills to um, manage the consequences of those smart decisions. And yeah, that absolutely. involves being weirdly and um, contradictorily being very involved in certain points to make sure they have those skills and then being very comfortable going hands off and letting them find the consequences of bad decisions and, um, in less fraught circumstances, in places that have those um, invisible guardrails, yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah. Our next age group, mm -hmm. the the thirteen to seventeen, that's oh, uh, the knucklehead era. Yeah, the um, my <laughs> fall lobe isn't developed, but I think it is era. <laughs> the um, independent and dangerous era. Mm -hmm. They're driving. They're experimenting. Um, with things they probably shouldn't, alcohol um, is is very very deadly for that age group. Yeah. Um, motor vehicle accidents are eighty percent of what makes up the death rate in that age group. Um, they're not wearing seatbelts. Again, very distracted. They're on their cell phones. They've got friends in the car. They're driving too fast. Hmm. 
Um, but we see a majority of that age group, what we see is our motor vehicle accidents. And I've, I've seen some research. I haven't had a chance to really dive into the methodology, so I'm not 100% on, but apparently putting in the interior dash cam, mm -hmm. you know, the one, the, um, putting in a dash cam makes an enormous difference because even though there's a, some of us are a little, I don't know about this, but other nonsense. But it does apparently make a statistical difference in the how safely your kids drive. Yep. Because they're being supervised all the time. Yes. Yeah. And again, you know, I grew up in Montana. I grew up a very, very long ways away from my school. Um, mm -hmm. When I grew up, you could get a driver's license at the age of 14. And there was no speed limit yeah. in Montana. The speed limit was safe and prudent. Um, and my mom had this mm. lovely thing that they liked to call mother patrol. And, you know, it was amazing. I knew that while there weren't any dash cams out there at the time mm. when I was driving, I had the entire community of Beaverhead County watching me and, and, <laughs> and <laughs> reporting back to my parents if I was unsafe. And it really yeah. does make a huge difference. To have that community and that communication. I had forgotten that that time when uh, Montana had the safe and prudent as the speed limit. Yeah. Although if you get if you want to get really honest, safe and prudent as the guideline for driving means that you can't let anybody under twenty in a car at all. No, nope. <laughs> you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, I I mean I I definitely fall on the side of the debate that no, uh, even though sixteen is too young to be driving, it's better than your first year spent driving being outside of the house with, with without parents you have to report to. Oh, it's definitely a, um, it's definitely a lesser of two evils. Yep. But yeah, anything we can do to encourage that safe behavior in the car, you know, that's putting in cameras. If if you're not comfortable with the cameras, uh, your insurance company will provide can provide a little thing you plug into the car that will tell you about the stops and starts and the speeds. Yep. And there are there are apps you can install that connect with this accelerometer on your kid's phone that'll tell you how fast the phone is moving. Yep. You know, these yeah, are all you know they're not going anywhere without that phone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and these yeah. are these are all little things that you can do. Yep. Um yeah, so yeah, and motor, motor vehicle accidents. Is... Motor vehicle accidents, as well mm -hmm. as surprisingly in Bend, what we see a lot of is e-bike accidents. So it goes back to the bicycle, kids not wearing helmets. Um, you know, you can ride an e-bike in Bend at the age of 13 mm -hmm. legally. Um, and those things go 25 miles an hour and yeah. they are deadly. Mm -hmm. And kids, of course, again, aren't wearing helmets. They're going 25 miles an hour. And anywhere in central Oregon, there's bound to be cinder on the road from the winter and they slip and, or they, you know, make poor judgment of how fast a vehicle is coming when they're pulling out into traffic. So just yeah. early education on those small safety things can save a life. And again, helmets. Yep. Um, and, and that reminded me of uh, another point about the motor vehicles, uh, just understanding that as a parent, the schools aren't the only people who get to choose if it's a snow, it's a snow day. Yeah. I mean, that's if, if you, like when I was, when I was in high school, our school superintendent was from North Dakota mm -hmm. and this is Oregon. This is Portland, Oregon, not Bend, Oregon. We see snow mm -hmm. every other year. Yeah. You know, so what he wanted to see for a snow day uh, ended up uh, severely injuring a few kids yeah. uh, because you got a, somebody has been driving for six months trying to navigate those roads. Yeah. So if you look out there as a parent and you're like, you know, we're not, we're not driving today, buddy. Uh, stay home, check, send your teachers an email. And um, that is absolutely within our rights, yeah. no matter what the attendance policy of your high school says. Yeah, absolutely agree. We have, uh, we have a lot of, of um, independence as parents uh, that mm -hmm. we don't always uh, flex our muscles to protect our children. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a piece of information related to that that I think is really important that I got from a, a bodyguard who came on the show is that when you're at the institutional level, and that's things like snow day policies, that's things like active shooter drills, um, most of those policies are developed from the point of view of protecting the institution from lawsuits, mm -hmm. not from the point of view of saving an individual person, including your child. Correct. And just internalizing that information and letting it inform your decisions about whether or not to trust a policy, I think, is something that we can. We're, we're yeah. diverting 
diverging a little bit, but it's um, we are we are something yeah. to, it's something to keep in mind, keeping our kids safe and can keep them out of your your ER. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. always know what's best for your child, mm-hmm. and your child relies on you because they can't yeah. make those decisions on their own. Yeah. So, yeah, and um, you know, a lot with this older age group, um, what we are seeing a lot, and what a lot of emergency departments are seeing in um, nationwide is this the epidemic of kids harming themselves due to things that are posted on social media yeah um or the way that kids have made others feel um overdosing on medications such as tylenol we had Mm -hmm. three girls come into the emergency department the other day who took a dare to see who could take the most tylenol and one of them the girl who one um, had to be flown to Portland um, emergently because they, they just waited too long and we need to get those medicines in their system. Yeah. And you know, she needs, she's now at the point where she needs a liver transplant. Yeah, I was gonna ask if she still had a liver and the answer is no. No, um, no, yeah, which, you know, if you can't find a liver transplant, your 16 year old can't survive. Yeah, yeah. The LD50 on Tylenol is, scarily close to the uh, minimum effective dosage of Tylenol. Uh, yes. it's it, not is. A... it is, and, and um, kids, because their frontal lobes are not developed, don't understand the permanence yeah. of, of losing a life. They, they can't grasp that. And so it's our job as parents to, to, to educate them on that. Yeah. And folks, I'll direct you to um, our interview with Karen Latofsky and our interview with um, Kevin, Jar- not Jarvis, the other Kevin of Bully 101 and our interview with Dave, Dave Kovar, all of whom address suicide and bullying and cyberbullying. Yeah, those are big topics. Yeah, I'm glad you're doing interviews on those and getting the word out. Somebody has to. Yeah, and that's, um, it's depressing to hear that from your point of view as well, that you are you are seeing the impact of bullying of the, you know, there's, there's, there's two camps about cyberbullying that I run into. One is the, ah, oh, well, no one's getting their arm broken. There's nothing physical. It's not real. And then there's the other ones that understand that, well, maybe not, but first of all, it's unrelenting. It is. It's not like when we were growing up where we could go home and turn on some Metallica and, uh, you know, play D and D with our friends and be fine. Yep. Um, it's there all the time. And then also the fact that as an adult, would you rather have somebody break your arm in three places or find out your spouse was cheating on you? Um, (laughs) Those mental wounds are severe and profound, especially when you're so young that you haven't had a serious mental wound yet and you don't understand that this pain is going to be temporary Mm -hmm. and that no matter how ugly the situation feels, you know, by the time we're 30, 40, we've been through it a few times. We know it'll get better but those teens don't. And then you combine that with the fact that they don't really understand the permanence of death. And here we are. It's very dangerous. It is, unfortunately. Yeah. So yeah, those are our age groups. The thing Mm -hmm. that as an ER nurse that we really Mm -hmm. um, say to parents is, you know, always um, call poison control first, Mm because sometimes if they put that soap pod in their mouth and spit it out, Poison control may be able to say, you know, drink water. They don't need to go to the yeah. ER. There are different pathways before you're coming to see us. Um, call their primary care physician. Make sure they're going in for regular visits. Yeah. Um, if you do need to come to the ER, if your child has a fever, um, don't think we're not going to believe you. Go ahead. Give them the Tylenol. Give them the ibuprofen at home. We are trained. We know what a fever looks like in a kid, even mm. if the fever has started to come down because you treated them at home. Don't don't keep your kid miserable for the sake of getting back into the ER faster. You know that's yeah that's something common that we see um, mm. parents doing. Oh, well, if they have a hundred and four fever, we'll get right back. You know? yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily. We may mm. give you Tylenol in the triage room. So make sure that you're you're doing everything you can before you come into mm-hmm. us. And that comes um, again to educating ourselves, getting the training to know, mm-hmm. you know, what's a what's a bad fever, what's a what's a normal kid fever, yep. how you know, understanding our first aid, how to how to save a baby who's choking, which is different from the Heimlich maneuver we do on our cousin. It is. Yeah. Yeah. 
The other thing too, that um, when you talk about choking, I have really recommended, I don't know if you've seen them there. I call them the de-chokers. Um, have you seen any of these yet? Not I have name. mine. Um, I, my husband and I both carry them in our vehicles and we have one in our home. It's a mask oh. like this. Okay. Um, that hooks up to what looks like a toilet plunger. Uh. And there are some instances where um, you cannot, the Heimlich maneuver will <clears throat> not, you can't do it. You're not doing it properly. The, the patient's too small or too large. <clears throat> and you put this over their mouth and you push down and the suction on this mm. will help bring the food up. So I recommend these to anybody with an, uh, Oh yeah. Like anybody <clears throat> to have in their home. They, like I said, the masks come in three different sizes from infant to pediatric, which is the size that we have on here to adult. Just and that's just, it, it literally works like a toilet plunger it just uses vacuum pressure to dislodge that thing to dislodge it and pull it out and that's and you can do it without breaking anybody's ribs yeah yep and um i've been in a situation where i've had this in my vehicle and needed to do cpr on the side mm -hmm. of the road mm -hmm. and i was able to use use this to mm -hmm. help the family that's member a... provide air oh wow I'm, okay. not, I'm not putting my mouth down there <laughs> but if a family member or somebody else wants to do it that this will also work for that and that that looks a lot like the the they had those CPR masks that kind of got popular mm -hmm. when the AIDS epidemic was big. Yeah. That so you could give the mouth to mouth without the physical contact. Yeah. And it's problem. That's probably the same um the same part. It is. Uh, it doesn't have the two way valve on mm. it that some of them do, but it allows you to not have direct contact. Okay. Um. And again, you know, with CPR, the best. The evidence-based practice shows that um, hands-only CPR is the most effective yeah. to just pump hard and fast. And we've known that for a while. That I remember re-upping my first aid in like 2006, 2007 after, after a gap. I'm going, mm -hmm. ah, some bitch. Yeah. I wonder how long we've known that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's incredible um, mm -hmm. how you really can save a life. That's the first thing. Your blood has yeah. got oxygen in it. You just start mm -hmm. circulating that. You want to get that oxygenated blood to the brain. That's what's going to mm -hmm. save the life. Mm -hmm. That's so, funny. Yeah, but I love these. Excellent. Yeah, that that's a new one on me and that's yeah. uh oh, that's gonna yeah. go on my um that's gonna go on my recommendations list that's that's i can see immediately how useful that would be mm -hmm. especially for the very little ones where you know the kind of heimlich stuff even the you know you take the two fingers and go like that on yeah, the diaphragms yeah. it's those are very fragile bodies they especially are. when compared to um an adrenalized adult-sized human absolutely i i have um my next door neighbor his wife has mm -hmm. parkinson's I mm. bought one for him and her, and he sent me a note the other day that said, I've already had to use this three times. Wow. And um, it really is, they really are life-saving when you can't, you know, person's in a wheelchair, you can't get around fast enough. It's, they're yeah. really nice for all and ages. And, 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 and mentioning our elders, that's, a, that's important too. Now that, that's a whole other episode we could do. About. It is. <laughs> especially in Bend. <laughs> it is, especially in Bend, yeah. 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 Excellent. Well, Roma, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, yeah. Before I let you go, uh, what's the really smart question I should have asked you but didn't? Oh, geez. I don't know. That is, that's a, that's a really smart question, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I think, um, you know, gosh, if I could say anything that would, that keeps kids out of the emergency department, it is a, um, a parent that's paying attention and all mm -hmm. age groups where they're paying attention, they're not leaving their kid alone, they're paying attention to their social groups, they're paying attention to whether they're putting on their helmet when they're walking out the door. The, the safest thing you can do for your child is be present and pay attention. And, uh, the self-defense community makes a big deal about situational awareness, which I think is important, although, you know, condition yellow is not a personality, guys. Um, you know, the head on a swivel, I always sit with my back to the door. Okay, yeah. that's great. And do you always sit with your face towards your kid? Right. Um, and that's, that's a little snarkier than, uh, than I intended it to sound, but that, that mindful awareness, it's, 
does spot bad guys coming, but let's look at the top five causes of death in every age group. This is not going to be a bad guy. No. Um, it also protects you from your child drowning tragically. It also protects you when you're driving. It, uh, if you go deeper, it protects you from a bunch of preventable illnesses. Yep. And so, and also you, you see the rainbows and the puppies. Yeah. And that's nice yeah, too. You get to hear the good story. Yeah. You get to- you get to be, you know, the front row of your kid's life. And, yeah. and what's better than that? Nothing. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Roma. So, so much for coming on today. I know you're very, very, very busy. Yeah, I get to go to work in an hour and a half. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your generosity of your time. And thank you, everybody, for watching today. Stay safe, everybody. We'll see you next week.